Well, that sure is a pretty picture you got there. <laughs> Thank you for doing this for us today, Josh. Oh, no, are you kidding me? It's my great pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. This will, this will be fun, hopefully. Yes, I know we had about 12 people registered, and then I sent out a last-minute email to get some more people. Cool. So we'll start right at 1. Sounds good. So I thought I'd be a little cheeky with my Zoom background there. You think anybody's going to pitch a fit, or is that clever? No, I like it. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> cool. All right. That way, if they yell at me, it can be on you. <laughs> Perfect. And just so that I know, you guys did have uh, like the handbook and PDFs and all that stuff still handy, right? Because I'm going to speak to that a little bit. And if you didn't, I was going to make sure we got that out to people today. Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. Um, I was about to say I, something. <laughs> I don't have it on my end, but if you have it and can share that, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. I was going to make sure we got a couple of little freebies. I mean, um, keep conversation going. This is, you guys have seen this before. What I'm basically doing is I've carved out two of the modules from the whole like two hour dig training that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we've thrown in just a couple of COVID items that I'm going to have Jason speak to. So a little bit focused. So I, I felt like if I just gave him the whole handbook that might provoke some questions. Yeah, I think that's going to be great.
and then whenever you're ready, we did spend a little time testing this yesterday, and I think all the audio and video and everything is going to do what it needs to, but I'd like to get your feedback before we go live with it. Okay, that sounds good. I am ready whenever you are. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, kill a few things on my screen here, and then if you want to work it out to give me screen sharing. Yes. Just a second. All right, I just made you a co-host of the meeting, so that should allow you to screen share. Got it. All right, so let me test a couple things here. All right, so can you see the PowerPoint right now? Yes. All right, so two things I want to test. First one's we've got a uh, little bit of audio uh, and some text. want to make sure that you can see it and you can okay. hear it. And then at one point, I'm going to try to talk, and I want to get a sense of – can you hear me or am I over talking the video or if there's any static or anything? Okay, sounds good. Digital information is a part of our lives. We use it every day at work and at home, whether it is Facebook, LinkedIn, Salesforce. How's the video and audio on that? It's perfect. Good, no skipping, nothing like that? Mm-mm. Excellent. All right. Online banking, email, the video, or various or website or mobile applications. I mainly hear the video. Okay. I could hear you a little bit, but not as clear. Cool. All right. That's. Uh, I will probably not speak at all during the video, but I'm going to have to. We figured out that Zoom is a little funky with video in PowerPoint in Zoom. <laughs> so <Yep. laughs> I got to watch the mouse clicks. Uh, okay. So I've got a couple of slides here where I had to drop some uh, pictures in. Okay. I just want to make sure. I know this is a little skewed, but is this legible to you? Yeah, I can read it really well. Okay. And that? Mm-hmm. And that? Yes. Excellent. All right. That's really the whole deal. Um, so we've got something like five videos, and I've got a little discussion in between. So if that's all satisfactory to you, then that's really all we've got in the presentation. So. It's perfect. Should work really well. Cool. All right. I'm going to kick back screen to you then. Okay.
And kids, when you get a second, I think Jason's trying to, oh, wait, never mind. I can click the button, looky there. <laughs> Can you hear me, Josh? Sir, yes, sir. Awesome. Where's your fancy headshot? Oh, never even tried to upload one. I see how it is. Can probably figure that out real quick. Kenzie changed her mind. She said that she actually doesn't want us to do this because we're boring, so she's just going to cancel for the day. Understood. Oh, do you have to have a Zoom account to upload something? Oh, yeah, it's free. Just the email password confirm. Everything seem to be working all right? Yeah, so far so good. We tested all yesterday. I did it uh, at the conference room and then in my dungeon over here. And I think the six monitors just lends itself to <laughs> things working better. So my webcam is like wanting to be fuzzy today for some reason. I don't know what that's about. It's all right. I may give a crap about seeing me. Aaron, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, I can screen share whenever you're ready. Okay, give me just a second and I will stop mine. Okay. Um, when she goes into the bio, because I lose my controls as well and I'm only operating on one screen, uh, <laughs> Give me just a minute, I'll uh, and I'll make that transition. It'll just take me a few seconds longer than normal.
Hello. Howdy. Hi. Is this Josh? Oh, it is. Hi, I'm Dawn. I haven't met you. I'm from the chamber. Oh, you're not missing much, I think. How are you, Dawn? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Overworked and underpaid. What are you going to do, right? I know it. I know it. Um, uh, so, hey, I'm going to just give you a quick little rundown. I'm going to be introducing you. Okay. Um, I don't even, I don't know how many have registered for this, but um, Aaron will tell us when and most of the folks have registered. Um, and then I'll go ahead and introduce you. Well, I'll kind of do a little welcome. Then we have a sponsor video that we're going to queue up. And okay. then, then I will introduce you. And then um, you'll go through your presentation. Um, and if there are questions, well, hopefully there will be. And you'll do a Q&A. And then that'll be it. Quick and painless. I like it. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, no, you kidding? That's my great pleasure. We're, we're excited to be able to do this for you guys. We appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and we are very excited to have you guys working on the women's conference with us, too. <laughs> okay. Very, really, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. Yeah, no, we're, we're itching for those sort of opportunities. It's no mystery right now. We're all kind of, you know, starved for one-to-one -one interaction, and this is the best thing that we've got going, just doing these classes. Yeah. And stuff. So we're, we're at yep. your disposal. Yep, yep. So. Awesome. And we had 12 registrations for this event. Oh, okay, good. Um, all right. And I don't know where they are. Okay, got it. Oh, I made a mistake. Unacceptable. That's, <laughs> it kind of is, actually. <laughs> Sorry. We are having a great women's conference coming up, and somebody else will be doing that. Sorry. My feelings are hurt. We were just getting to know each other, Don. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you guys don't. I don't think you do that kind of stuff anyway, do you? <laughs> no, I mean, we're... We, we like to share and be a part of things wherever the opportunities there, especially with this stuff, because what we find is there's no group or vertical or organization that this doesn't impact. So, Right, right. So. All right. Oh, almost there. I don't know if you, anybody's gotten out today, but it is absolutely gorgeous outside. Yes, it is. And your, um, where's your office? So we're actually over off Campbell Lane in Destiny Place, um, right across the street from Bowling Green Christian Academy. Okay, I think I have a pretty good idea where that is. I'm new to the area. I just moved here, so. Oh, gotcha. So, Aaron, I'm going to look to you to tell us when to go ahead and get started. Why not? We've got more participants. Okay. Um, I say give everybody about two more minutes and maybe then maybe get started after that. Okay.
Well, maybe just a smidge longer. Let's see if anybody else is going to join us. <clears throat> So, Josh, what do you think? Ready to get started? Hey, I'm on your time. Do your thing. All right. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dawn Johnson. I am the vice president here at the, uh, well, I was going to give you my old job, the Bowling Green Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, I have been here uh, going on oh, eight, nine, 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 ten weeks now. Um, so I am fairly new, still have my my other job in my on my brain a little bit. So um, I just wanted to welcome you today to Business at Its Best seminar uh, on cybersecurity awareness training. And I know right now with all of the, the things that are go going on COVID wise, there's a lot of extra different types of spamming going on um, and, and a lot of different uh, scams too. So um, I do want to um, do a few housekeeping rules to let you know a few housekeeping rules. Today's session is being recorded. So keep your mics on mute for the duration of the presentation. And if you have questions, they can be submitted via uh, chat, the chat window. Um, if you see, or you can see an example that Aaron is submitting and that way uh, if you have Q&A questions, I am not speaking well. The Q&A uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll read your submissions and or I think we have a, a an intimate crowd so we might even be able to do some actual voice um, interaction and Q, Q and a so but before we get started uh, we do want to honor our sponsor and without our sponsors we cannot do a lot of the programming that we do so Graves Gilbert Clinic is our title sponsor for business at its best and Aaron's gonna have a video to show you Are we having technical difficulty, Erin? We are. Give me just a second. Can okay. You, can you give me permissions to screen share, Erin? I just did, Katie. Okay. So Josh, tell me about the background. What, oh, never mind. We got it. Their top priority is the health and safety of their patients, employees, and visitors. And because of that, Graves Gilbert Clinic is now offering telehealth visits, which allows patients and physicians to use an app to communicate via video chat. Any patient who would like to schedule a telehealth appointment is encouraged to call their Graves Gilbert Clinic physician's office directly or call the Graves Gilbert Clinic telehealth at Awesome. Thank you, Erin. And thank you, Graves Gilbert Clinic, for being our title sponsor. Uh, and today it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Josh Gossett, the owner and co-founder of Cortec LLC. Josh has lived in Bowling Green since 2001 when he moved from his hometown of Madisonville to attend WKU. And in 2006, he and a fellow classmate created a small business specializing in computer compare rep computer repair and then called the PC Gurus. Eventually his little company his little computer repair shop evolved into its incarnation today, a fully managed IT services and cybersecurity company for small to medium-sized businesses known as Cortec. Josh, we appreciate you being here and partnering with us, and I am going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Don. No pressure at all. Uh, yes, and that business partner is on the call today, and one of the first things I want to do before we get into the content is please, as we go along, um, what we've done for you guys today is we actually do a training for most of our incoming new clients. We also do this out in the community, and we've taken a couple of the modules 
from that onboarding and that training, and we're going to share them today. But uh, on the line with me is my business partner and, frankly, the mastermind behind all the networks we install, and that's Jason Cook. So I want to invite everybody, please, as you're seeing things that you're interested in or you have questions, uh, please get those out. Uh, Daryl uh, is also with us. He's my sort of new client concierge. It's his responsibility to engage with you if you come in and to help get you uh, acclimated uh, as, as a core tech partner. So just know that we've got all of our boots on the ground for you today. One of the things I want to kind of set this this precedence um, before we get into the training. And by the way, the way that the format, the way this works, I've got a little intro video. It's about three or four minutes. And then I have two case studies. So the flow of this is we're going to set up a case study. It's going to highlight the issue that we're kind of dealing with in, in real life with fictional characters. Uh, and then there's going to be a, a sort of lessons learned, like what's going on and some educational stuff. You'll notice in your chat, by the way, I've linked a couple of resources. And the very first one is a handbook. Now, I included the handbook for the entire training just for your uh, benefit. There's also a couple little freebies there. But uh, we will be kind of speaking to that excuse me, and following along as well, because I'm going to do my level best to avoid the geek speak, but with cybersecurity, it's not, uh, that's not entirely possible, right? So just know that those are there. Um, when we speak about cybersecurity, and I, I don't think I have to tell anybody on this call how crazy the times are and what we're all going through. Um, you know, I forget the percentage of the quote, but I know that, that the small percentage in life is, are the things that happen to us, and the vast uh, majority of the percentage is how we all deal with it. And I think all of us right now are in the thick of that, um, I, I am extremely proud right now to be a part of this community and, and be an entrepreneur in these times because I, I know one thing about entrepreneurs and that's that we are all adept at surviving. <laughs> we're all adept at adapting. And, uh, and if you look at just today's training, we're all doing the best we can. So we are humbled and blessed to be a, a, an entrepreneur with you guys. And we're humbled and blessed to be not just a part of the chamber, but to count the chamber uh, as a client. And obviously they're doing everything they can to help us all get through this. Uh, all of that being said, uh, as we get into this, when we speak about cybersecurity, I want to share, let me give me a screen share going here for you guys. Ta-da. Hopefully you guys can see that. Somebody freak out on the microphone if not. Um, when we speak about cybersecurity, we speak in the context of being secure online, especially in this day and age, uh, as, a, as a behavior, not an event. OK, I, I wish that I could tell you you could go out and buy the very best of, of technology, the coolest firewalls, the smartest antivirus, uh, all those widgets and bells and whistles and, and your network and your information would be 100 percent safe. I, I wish I could tell you that. Um, further, I wish that I could tell you that you could hire the smartest people on planet Earth, um, ideally us, but uh, the best of the best of the best in terms of installing networks and supporting networks and securing networks and, and that you'd be fine. Uh, I wish I could tell you that, but I can't. And the reason that I can't, really two reasons. The first one is at the end of the day, it's the human being at the keyboard that represents the biggest risk to your business, um, yourself and your employees. Not because you're, you're negligent, not because you're malicious, but because you have a job to do. You're busy in your business and cybersecurity, let's just face facts, is not typically top of mind for the average employee. And so that's where we come in. Um, we find that educating the typical user, educating the typical person who's clicking on the emails, who's using your CRM, who's inside of your QuickBooks, keeping those folks educated, keeping those folks aware, that's where we can get you just as to near zero in terms of being at risk of a hacker. And the second thing is, as you guys all know, again, in the, in the troubled times that we're dealing with, uh, while all of us are the good guys, we're trying to make do and get by, uh, you know, where, where businesses are suffering, our clients are suffering, our families are suffering, and we're all doing the very best that we can. Unfortunately for all of us, there are bad guys out there who are going to extort and exploit that. And cybersecurity is always a concern. It's our core business these days, and it's always a risk to yours. But in the midst of tragedy, a um, lot we've seen a lot of new scams, and we're going to speak to some of that today. Um, just a touch, uh, the behavior side of things. When we look at your business and we talk in terms of how to be secure, there's a whole lot that goes into it. I'm not going to go over all of this today, uh, but this is a checklist document that we use. There's actually 15 different checkpoints that we look at to be able to say, hey, your business is equipped and as secure as you possibly can be. And you'll see a lot of buzzword type things there. I know the dark web is something that's, that's very common these days with all of us working from home. Uh, mobile device stuff and remote access is becoming a big thing as well. So today we're going to focus strictly on the training aspect. And the thing that I'm going to ask you right off the bat uh, uh, is this. 
understand that we are all at risk, understand that the idea that just because we're a little small business, maybe you're a retail shop or an accounting firm or whatever your role is in the Bowling Green community, um, you are not special. You are not immune. We are all at risk to this. And this idea that, well, uh, I'm not at risk. I'm just a little guy. I'm just in Nowheresville, Kentucky. You know, nobody wants my information. I'm not Nike or Apple or Coca-Cola. Uh, trust me when I tell you, uh, it's the small businesses who really are at risk. It's the small businesses who have precious information and not an unlimited budget to afford all of the great cybersecurity things who who get attacked. So just kind of put that uh, in your mind as we go along here. I'm going to reiterate, please, as the videos are playing, if you have a question, something that jumps out at you, put that in the chat and we're going to address that as we go along. There's time in between each of the modules uh, and then also at the end. So with all of that said, let me, uh, let me see if Zoom's going to blow up or this is going to play for you. Digital information is a part of our lives. We use it every day, at work and at home, whether it is Facebook, LinkedIn, Salesforce, online banking, email, or various website or mobile applications. But the need to safeguard this information has not only changed, it has made having digital information a liability. In our always connected society, cyber criminals are wreaking havoc and cyberspace has become the Wild West. Cyber criminals are no longer just teenagers with good computer skills. Cybercrime is a multi-billion dollar business and organized crime rings worldwide have joined the action. These criminals are sophisticated and spend every day thinking about how they can steal and profit off of making you or your company a victim. In an IBM study, they found that 95% of data breaches were caused by human error. That's right, us humans are the leading cause of data breaches. Whether it is losing a smartphone or laptop or falling victim to a phishing scam, it is very easy to be a victim of a data breach. This training will raise awareness of the ways criminals are trying to steal your personal information as well as your company's sensitive data. The more aware you are regarding data breaches, the better you can be at protecting against a data breach. Criminals try many different ways to steal or access personally identifiable information, or PII for short. PII is any information that can identify or locate a person. Examples include names, addresses, date of birth, social security numbers, bank account information, and credit card information, among others. Sensitive company data is confidential information that could be harmful to an organization if exposed. Examples include trade secrets, merger plans, financials, manufacturing processes, and even emails. PII, or sensitive company data, in the wrong hands can be damaging to a company. Not only can a data breach hurt employees or customers, but it can damage a company's reputation. PII and sensitive company data can be used for many criminal activities. These activities include identity theft, tax scams, opening fraudulent credit cards, accessing bank accounts, and transferring or stealing money. Sensitive company information can be used for blackmail, spying on competition, stock manipulation, or stealing trade secrets. We use or access PII or sensitive company data all the time. This data could be in various systems, applications, or files that may be part of our jobs. These include customer relationship management CRM systems, such as Salesforce, CRM systems contain a wealth of customer information. HR systems have PII for all employees and contractors. Payroll systems contain W-2 tax information for employees. Email could have PII and sensitive company data. There could be secrets or damaging information contained in these emails. A company's website may collect PII, including names, addresses, and even credit card information. 
And don't forget about paper-based PII, such as printed reports. So now that you know cyber criminals are becoming very sophisticated, and you know that they are after your personal PII or your company sensitive information, let's take a look at how they commit their crimes. In the next section, we will present a series of case studies that hopefully you will find interesting. Knowing how other individuals and companies fell victim to a cybercrime should help you avoid a similar fate. As you watch these case studies, we suspect you may say to yourself, I don't want this happening to me. So grab some popcorn or a cup of coffee and let's get started. All right, so maybe no popcorn today. Usually we do this live, right? But so I wanted to share that up front just to kind of set the stage. You know, there's a lot of misnomers and negative stigmas in IT, and there has been for a long time. And, and you heard it in this video, right? This notion that, that a hacker, quote, is just some malicious teenager, somebody who's just out to do something, something mean. And while that's at least partially true this day and age, how it affects us as businesses is a long way from what's relevant. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's highly profitable. Uh, and therefore we represent a, a smash and grab opportunity for these hackers. So uh, no longer is it something that, you know, people with computer skills are just out to get you out to do some something mean. Um, they're out to take advantage of, of your information, uh, your employees, your financial data, and as well as, as your client information. Uh, as business people, we're all stewards of the clients that we serve. And so uh, it's up to us to protect them, not just our own businesses. So I'm going to check out the chat here. Any thoughts about that, comments or questions, feel free to grab an um, unmute on the mic before we show off the first of the training videos. Good so far. Okay, so the first video that we're going to talk about is uh, one of the most common scams out there. And it's a phishing scam, uh, phishing PH, not F, but the concept is very much the same. So like I stated before, how this is going to go, we're going to we're going to lay up this this scenario and you're going to see uh, what can happen. And then we're going to talk about what phishing really is, things to look out for. My objective with this, by the way, and if you're following along in the book that I linked in the chat, uh, we're going to start on page three. There's some really good information there. My, my objective with this is that the things that you're going to learn today are easy to understand and actionable. Okay. I don't want this to be rhetorical stuff. So uh, as we go along, if something doesn't make sense, please, uh, please say so. Betty was doing her job, making sure that all the various financial aspects of Benny's manufacturing ran smoothly. On Tuesday morning, Betty received an email from Benny's bank. The email looked legitimate and warned of suspicious activity. Dear Betty, we suspect an unauthorized transaction on your account. To ensure that your account is not compromised, please click the link below and confirm your identity. Betty had enough to do, and dealing with banking issues was not on her list. She quickly wanted to resolve this issue and get back to her never-ending list of tasks. Betty clicked on the link and was presented with her bank's login screen. Betty has logged into this page more times than she would like to admit. She quickly entered the Benny's username and password and clicked sign in. But instead of logging in, she received a message that the page was not found. Betty was very frustrated. She didn't have time for this and told herself that she would try again in an hour. Unknown to Betty, she had fallen for a fake phishing email. The site she logged into was fake as well. Now the cyber criminals had Benny's banking credentials. The cyber criminals quickly went to work. They logged into the real banking website with the newly attained credentials and requested a transfer of $100,000 and another transfer of $75,000. As Betty continued her tasks, she got a strange feeling as though something wasn't right. Betty tried to log into the banking website again, but this time she went directly to the bank's website. When she did log in, to her horror, she saw the two wire transfer requests. Betty quickly called her bank and explained what happened. 
The bank was able to stop the second wire transfer, but the first went from Benny's Bank to a bank in Texas and then to a bank in East Europe. The $100,000 was never to be seen again. Benny's Manufacturing lost $100,000 and Betty, unfortunately, lost her job as a result of the incident. It's a tough day at the office, right? Um, that, that's the concept, right? And the name phishing is, is somewhat rhetorical but literal, right? These hackers are just casting these wide nets. They're sending uh, emails that look pretty legitimate and you've probably seen them for lots of years. I know uh, back in the day, the popular one uh, was the, the Nigerian prince that nobody's been able to find all these years, right? For, for uh, uh, just a little bit of help, he'll give you all this wealth and get into the US, et cetera. Uh, if you've ever used Facebook or Amazon, PayPal, Apple, at some point, you've probably seen an email attempting to get your information, to trick you into changing a password. And the frustrating part about phishing emails is they're very clever. They look legitimate. They use logos of the companies and they use links and so forth. So um, that's kind of the crux of why this stuff works is social engineering. It's uh, in our busy day-to-day -day life, we're, we're not always as vigilant over links and things in an email. Uh, and, and hackers know that. They know that we're busy. Uh, they know that we typically would trust something from Amazon or something from UPS and so forth. So that's that's kind of the rub and how they get us. So that's a scenario. And let's let's now look at some of the concepts. Phishing is a way of attempting to acquire sensitive information such as usernames, passwords, and credit card numbers or try to trick you into downloading a virus or malware by masquerading as a trustworthy entity, usually in an email. This is similar to actual fishing, where the fisherman puts a bait on the hook and pretends to be genuine food for the fish. Examples of phishing scams can be fake emails that appear to be real emails from Facebook, LinkedIn, PayPal, Amazon, banks such as Bank of America or Wells Fargo, and even your friends, colleagues, or IT administrators. Basically, they can appear to be from anyone you trust. Phishing often directs users to enter details on a fake website whose look and feel are almost identical to the legitimate one. This is what we saw in the example with Betty and the fake bank website. How do you spot a phishing scam? You can spot a phishing email taking these three steps. Step one, look at the email message. Carefully look at the sender's email address. Look for typos or mismatched email domain names. Look for the use of generic greetings such as cardholder or dear customer. Cyber criminals use generic greetings because they may not know your name. They might send out thousands or even millions of fake emails hoping that someone falls for their scam. Look for spelling and grammar mistakes. Any misspellings or poor grammar might be a signal of a phishing email. Look for messages with threatening language or one that requires immediate action. Criminals will often use threatening language to scare a reader into disclosing some of their information or clicking on a harmful link. These threats may be, your account has been compromised, or your account will be terminated if you do not act now. Step two, approach embedded links with caution. Be very wary of embedded links, as just a simple click could download a virus on your computer. In addition, links can lead you to fake websites where you could be lured into providing account or sensitive information. When in doubt, move your mouse and hover over a link to see where the address leads. If it is not the domain of the company that sent the email, don't click on it. Step 3. Be cautious with email file attachments. Phishing emails may try to trick you into downloading or opening malicious attachments. These attachments might be Microsoft Word or Excel files. They may also be PDF or compressed files, such as zip files. Be extra cautious if you receive any security warnings from your email program or applications. Spear phishing. Probably the most dangerous example of phishing is spear phishing. As we saw in Betty's case, spear phishing is an email targeted directly at 
you. It might have personalized information such as your name, address, and even your phone number. It could be sent from a friend, family member, or even from a colleague. The email may have information that only a few people might know. That is what makes spear phishing so dangerous. It is very hard to spot a spear phishing email. Spear phishing emails might be asking for user accounts, passwords, or financial accounts. If you are the least bit suspicious, then don't provide the information and don't click on links or download file attachments. Pick up the phone and call the person or send a new email to the person to confirm that they sent the email to you. Don't click on a link, but instead type the company's web address into your browser. A little bit of paranoia can go a long way to preventing a successful spear phishing scam. And remember, if you think you've been a victim of a phishing scam, contact your supervisor and your IT department immediately. Let's see about the chat here. We've got a couple of examples, and, and there was a lot of information there. Again, calling you back to the workbook. I've got some things that are in there. Um, when in doubt, don't click uh, is something that, you know, we often tell people like in the, in like the video stated, a little paranoia does go a long way. Um, you never know where clicking on something that's been sent to you might take you and you always have the prerogative to go somewhere manually if you know a web address and so forth. Uh, certainly email attachments are always the really scary one. Uh, one of the most common things that we see is an email attachment that has two file extensions. Uh, there's no such thing as a dot. Uh, XLS dot PDF, right? It's either a spreadsheet or a document. Uh, sometimes you'll see that in an email where someone sent something to you and it may look legitimate like invoice dot PDF, but it also might say dot something else. And that's kind of a dead giveaway. But some of that stuff is, is there in the workbook for you. I've got a couple of examples of more recent scams that we're seeing related to COVID. And as I promised you, um, the bad guys are going to take advantage of, of bad scenarios, right? And around tax time, we're always accustomed to seeing like tax scams, file returns, this kind of stuff. But here, for example, is something where uh, it was a phishing email. Somebody was trying to take advantage of, of just scare tactics, right? Uh, early on when all of this stuff was breaking and people didn't know really what was going to happen dealing with quarantine, you had things like this uh, popping out. And if you look closely at this, and I know it's a little bit, I kind of tried to blow it up so you could see some of the text. Uh, this email is posing as though it's coming straight from the CDC. Uh, you'll notice there's an attachment there, uh, just as I indicated a moment ago, it says .pdf.arj, uh, and, and a lot of that urgent language, right? And, and it, it, who knows if this could look legitimate, perhaps if you had just been to the doctor, if you've been following Facebook or, uh, you know, Andy's address, you know, it, it would be easy to see something like this and, and, and raise a question or be scared. Um, and there's a lot of these that are, that are kind of uh, swimming around the internet. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this one I think was more directed at it basically as a doctor, same kind of deal. There's an attachment that they're wanting you to click on. Um, Dear Serge and Eric Greeting, a lot of things that we learned in the video. Uh, again, more of the same, just trying to capitalize on fear and uncertainty uh, and, and doubt. Uh, here's another one. Again, very similar. Uh, Department of some e-health marketing, whatever that is, right? Um, but again, if you, if you had recently been... Uh, uh, you know, concerned, or maybe you've done like a telehealth reach out or something. Uh, again, like the Facebook scams, you know, if you've seen in the video, it talked about how you can actually be exploited, not actually by your friend or family member, but someone posing as. Uh, this can also happen with companies. It could, you could get an email that was posing as a local medical facility, and in fact, it wouldn't be them, it would be a hacker. So, um, at this leg of the race, I'd like to actually invite Jason. He's my, again, resident expert. Um, he's got some thoughts and things about fishing in general and some of the things we've been seeing. And I actually can't see the chat right now. So if you can see if we've got questions or, 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 or such, let's take just a minute or two here and, and break from the video if we could. Sure. Thanks, Josh, for bringing me in. Uh, one of the big things I always like to talk about at this point, uh, especially with fishing for small businesses, one of the biggest uh, attacks that we see and one of the biggest uh, financial hits that small businesses can take is related to ransomware attacks. And what we see with ransomware and email is an email being sent just like Josh has shown, but it'll be a Word document that may say invoice uh, or shipping manifest or something like that. 
you'll open this Word document and then it'll ask you to enable macros or enable some extra feature. The act of doing that right there will run back in scripts on your computer that will kick off a ransomware attack. Ransomware, and the reason it's so dangerous, is it actually encrypts all the data on your machine and encrypts any drives you have access to on servers. Then what it'll do is it will uh, request you to pay in Bitcoin some ransom to get access to your data files. And unfortunately, uh, it's very common and very, very easy to get and antivirus software has a very difficult time detecting it because in a lot of cases it will use actual legitimate um, tools that Microsoft creates to administrate servers to perform the, the attack. Um, so one of the big things that we try to stress upon people, as Josh is showing you guys, is be very mindful of, of your attachments, what they're doing, what it's asking you to do, um, and, and who it's coming from. Um, another way that, that people can get taken advantage of is if you are got a vendor or a colleague and their email was compromised, meaning they fell for a scam, gave that username and password out, and now the email is going to come to you from the person's um, email account, so it's going to immediately lower your guard and, um, and you're going to be more likely to hit the button. Um, the, the attachment or whatnot. So if you ever get an email from somebody and, and you're confused as to why you got it, make, uh, make that kind of a red alarm in your mind that that may not be a legitimate email from that person. Definitely. Thank you. And actually, and on that note, by the way, back to the couple of, of things that we linked in the chat, uh, I put a little uh, white paper in there. It's just very informational. It kind of gives you some base definitions and, and things to look out for. Uh, it's, it's our core tech guide to ransomware. Ransomware is like its whole other lesson and conversation of its own. And we don't have time really to get to that today. But as Jason said, it's, it's, an, it's an important caveat. Um, so know that that's there. You're welcome to that to read through it and have it uh, for your own. So. Uh, thoughts or questions, comments on that? Anybody ran into anything like this? Has anybody gotten any of the uh, stimulus check, uh, you know, scams where you get an email that, talking about, hey, come and get your stimulus money or anything related to COVID, anything that anyone wants to share? All righty then. All right, so the next thing uh, I'd like to talk about, and the two are pretty much, they're very, they're related. And, and this one, the next one is, this is not uh, interesting. It's not, it's not exciting and it's not sexy as it were, uh, but it's necessary. And so what we're gonna talk about and how some of these phishing attacks ultimately get you, as the video stated, they're trying to, to, to trick you into giving information, right? So giving maybe an email address that you use to log into Facebook or, or potentially uh, trying to show you an old password that you once used. And the whole idea is that once they grab that information, now they can go out into the world and they can try that all over the place and get access to other things. So what we're going to talk about in a minute is, is a couple of things. It's related to how you access websites with usernames and passwords. And the next uh, two tips here are very actionable. We're going to make some recommendations on not just things that you can do, but some software that you can get to, to help you with this. So uh, let's take a look at this next video. was an aggressive salesperson for Lizard Insurance. She won Salesperson of the Year last year, leading the company in sales four out of the last six months. Sally used all methods to shake the tree for leads. She asked clients for referrals, attended conferences, and utilized social media to help land potential clients. Sally had a lot going on and recorded everything she did in Salesforce, which was the Lizard Cloud-based Customer Relationship Management CRM system. Unfortunately for Sally, her LinkedIn account was compromised when LinkedIn experienced a data breach of 167 million accounts. LinkedIn emailed Sally and told her about the breach. They also reset her password and required her to change it on her next login. Sally was unfazed by the notification 
She had received breach notification letters from her health insurance company and credit card company before. There are so many data breaches these days that it is part of life. What Sally didn't realize at the time was that while she reset her LinkedIn password, she had used the same email address and password for many other websites. It was easier to use the same credentials than having to remember a different password for each website. One day, Sally tried to log into Salesforce, but the site would not take her email and password. She called Lizard's IT company, and they told her that someone had logged into her account and changed the password. Upon further investigation, the IT company determined that the same people who logged into Sally's account had exported all the details of her accounts and clients out of Salesforce. Lizard was now looking at a data breach of over 5,000 individuals. Sally went from salesperson of the year to causing the largest breach Lizard has ever faced. Just a comment there before we look at some of the lessons learned. The thing I always like to speak to in this video is it wasn't Sally the salesperson um, that, that they directly it was affected, right? In this particular case, it was a LinkedIn breach. And it, that's something that when we kind of consult and engage with, with people, a lot of times we'll hear things like, well, I changed my password a lot, or uh, I use different passwords for every site. Because I know nobody on this call uses the same passwords uh, or, you know, capitalize this or add an exclamation point. I know that's nobody on here, um, but, but we're all guilty of it, right? We have a thousand websites, a thousand logins. Uh, if it's a banking website or something that's secure, they're frequently asking you to change it. And let's just face facts, that's a nuisance, right? It's, it's aggravating, we have to do password resets. And a lot of times we, 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 as humans, we tend to sacrifice our security for convenience, right? And dealing with some of this stuff is not very convenient and therefore we sacrifice the security. Um, but, but that's where, that's the gotcha. And, and um, it, it's not just a single uh, entity or a piece of information that you're using. It could be uh, that you were leveraging a website that was victimized and because you had an association with it, you're now also in trouble. So uh, it, keep, keep in mind that it's not just you and the buttons you're clicking always. Sally was an aggressive salesperson for Lizard Insurance. She won Salesperson of the Year last year, leading the company in sales four out of the last six months. Reusing passwords across various systems and websites that may be storing PII and sensitive data is a major risk that everyone needs to be aware of. Once a cyber criminal identifies one of your passwords, they can easily find multiple places and ways to use it. Using passwords across multiple systems and sites may also be a violation of your company's policies and procedures, potentially putting your job at risk. When creating a password for a system or website, always use unique and complex passwords every time. Some of the most commonly used passwords are obvious, and it's surprising to think people would use these. Some of the most common are 123456. Password, ABC123, football. None of these would be hard to guess. Let's look at some tips on how to create a complex password. Password should be a minimum of eight characters. Use a mix of upper and lower case letters and include a special character, such as ampersand, at sign, exclamation point, asterisk. Be creative with your passwords. The longer you make them, the harder they will be to guess. Hackers will typically use what is called a brute force attack, which quickly guesses different password combinations to try to break into an account. These attacks can run hundreds of thousands of password combinations until they find the right one. By creating complex passwords, you can prevent a hacker from effectively using these attacks to guess your credentials. We know
know the importance of creating and maintaining secure passwords. But how are you supposed to remember all these passwords for so many sites? The answer is a password manager. Password managers store your login information for all the websites and applications you use. All your passwords are stored in a secure database, and the only thing you need to remember is your master password. But make sure you are using a really strong and complex password for your master password. Another method that you could use to protect PII and sensitive data is to use two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication, or 2FA, is a security measure designed to add an extra layer of protection when accessing critical applications. Just entering your username and password would be considered a single-factor authentication. But a second form of authentication can be a great security measure to keep criminals at bay. The most common form of 2FA is done with an additional code sent through text message or accessed via an application on your smartphone. Without the additional code, the cyber criminal cannot access your account, even if they have your password. This additional verification should be utilized for accessing all critical systems. If you remember back to our first case study, Betty the bookkeeper gave out her user ID and password when she fell for a phishing scam. If Betty would have enabled two-factor authentication on Benny's banking login, the criminals would not have been able to access the bank account and transfer the money. Took some years off of poor Betty the bookkeeper there, huh? Uh, let me, we've got an example here, and Jason, I'm gonna give you the floor again on this one, unless we have a question about, we actually take it a, a step further when we're consulting about passwords and password management in general. And frankly, I think if Jason had his way, uh, he'd have our cars and front doors with, <laughs> with two FA. So, um, but Jason, I know you've got some thoughts here and I've got a slide prepared for you. So why don't you jump in? Sure. So when we look at passwords, um, you see right there, there there's just a, a real basic password, uh, easy to identify. Um, we try to coach people on using kind of a sentence structure password, um, kind of running all the characters together um, and creating a sentence out of them. So you can still use, um, you know, words and sentences uh, that are easy to remember and meaningful to you, but doing it in a way where it's not going to be in, in a dictionary uh, in an easy way to start stuffing credentials into a uh, website. So as you'll you'll see the password one, two, three, down to not password one, two, three, four, exclamation mark. You know, it's a, that's a long password, but it's still easy. Uh, it's still easier for somebody to come up with that using the type of attack uh, vectors that are out there. When we see this we.r.all.n.this.together, you know, that's easy to remember, but somebody's actually gonna have to know that password. They're not gonna gather that password. Um, from a uh, from a dictionary, you know, where they're going to be able to piece that together in words and combinations that would come together. And that's what makes those type of passwords really strong. So what we do and what we recommend is using a password manager, one like a company called LastPass owned by LogMeIn creates a password manager. Um, you can use a complex password like that for the master password along with enabling two-factor authentication where you have to have a code from your phone to get into it. And then from there, you can actually use it to create all your other passwords where every site has a unique password. And even if your password showed up on the dark web, for instance, LinkedIn was hacked uh, 18 months, two years ago. So a lot of passwords are out there from, from business people who use LinkedIn to make their connections. A lot of people that we've worked with use the same exact password everywhere. So what will happen, that gets shared and sold on the dark web, then the hackers just take those passwords and those email accounts and they automate Am uh, those passwords into Amazon, into Rackspace email, uh, into Facebook. And once they get a hit, they then go in and start doing whatever they're trying to do um, to cause harm to the end user usually it's driven by some sort of monetary um, 
uh, gain out of it. So they're trying to grow their list or their 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 uh, their base, almost like a marketer would, um, or they're just trying to get um, you to let them into their system to deploy that ransomware or uh, you know lawyers, doctors, you know, getting those uh, personal records that they have access to um, is very valuable to be sold, uh, as well as locking out and demanding ransoms. So. Uh, password managers can really help people avoid that same password without going crazy with the idea that I'll never remember all these passwords. Uh, those, those also have apps for your iPhone and your Android uh, where you can even log into apps using the password manager. Um, it's it's how we kind of evolved at our um, office. We're, we're all using that, all using unique uh, passwords into all of our, our main system and we're using two-factor authentication with all of our systems. So um, even if a password was to get guessed, they would have to also steal my phone in order to get into the system. Thank you, sir. We've got some unmuted mics there. Do we have some comments or questions about this stuff? Yeah, I have a, a question about passwords. So, you know, you have to change them so often or everything you do, you have to get a password and a username and number one what ideas or suggestions i know the, the complex passwords with the ampersands and different the letters numbers caps all that stuff um but any best practices on that and then keeping track of them and is there an app or some sort of um, program that you can use that you can access easily because i forget all the time and I know mine are not in a spot that is safe. Yeah, great, great question there. I was trying to get the screen share to cooperate here. But so one of the programs that we utilize, and there's several out there just so that you know that have both premium and free services. Uh, this program, LastPass, is the one that we really like. It was recently acquired by LogMeIn. Uh, which we are a partner with. We sell some of their services and hardware, but we were using this this service uh, honestly before then. Um, it, it's a really great quick way to create a, an account, to get in, to get it set up and to use it. Uh, obviously there's some more advanced things uh, that you can do with it, but that would be the kind of thing that we could help you with once you, once you explore it. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, using something like that's really easy. It, it, it'll walk you through everything. Um, as you start to add your passwords to it, um, by, what you'll want to do is install the web browser plugins for Chrome or Firefox uh, from their website. It'll even help you. You can go to a section and it'll help you identify websites you may have the same password on um, and, 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 and allow you to proactively change that because um, you know you'll you'll have hundreds of passwords uh, you know because of everything being digital these days it's really right. easy to you know just forget uh, that you've that you've used the same password over and over and over and uh, and then not even know that somebody out there even knows it until you've been compromised so right it's right. real it's real nice yeah and the sentence case things too and of course I'm being a little a little cheeky but the idea again is to help with memory what's great about sentence casing passwords is we can we 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 have lots of short phrases and sentences in our life you can use quotes if you like that you can use uh, verses you can use uh, uh, song lyrics you know if you have a favorite phrase or a catchphrase you know things that we use in, in our actual language as opposed to not password one two three four ampersand at sign pound right that stuff just right. isn't meaningful and half the time what you end up doing is writing it on a sticky note and sticking it on your monitor and you've not solved anything so <laughs> um I, I just as a real life example something i was going to share because i know you heard dark web there and i know that that's a buzzword um, I wanted to show you an example of something that we do for folks. And, you know, when I say to you, well, your information is on the dark web, that probably doesn't mean much to you. Um, we did, we, we run these reports and we actively scan and we watch things for our clients. In fact, I know we're doing that for the chamber. Um, here's an example of a report just to give you some context for what we're talking about. Um, when we go in and we run to see, you know, are you the person with an email address in fact compromised? Uh, nobody's going to call you, right? No, the hacker's not going to pick up the phone and say, hey, Don, by the way, uh, I grabbed your password for, from LinkedIn and I'm going to steal all your stuff. And right. so this is a tool that we use, and this is a, just kind of a one-time scan. And I'm just going to share with you, if you look here, you'll see real life email addresses. These are email addresses of myself. I'm right here somewhere uh, in our staff. 
Uh, you can even see just a, a, just a snippet of the password that was being used. And you'll notice a lot of the stuff is gobbledygook because we're using password managers. You can see how the information was stolen, where it came from, when it was breached, right? And some of this is old, right? You look at these, this, these dates, you say, oh, well, I've changed that password a thousand times since then. But going back to the very beginning of the video, sometimes that paranoia is important. And by actively monitoring this stuff, we know when like something like a fitness pal gets breached or, or Sony entertainment or TJ Maxx, you know what, if we have information that's out there that we have accounts with, this tool is very powerful. It, it lets us know at, at any point where we compromised and down the road as we go along and sign up for new things or download new apps on our phones or what have you, does my information get captured and allows us to be proactive as opposed to, to reactive and, and alert us to, hey, maybe that's not a site that I want to have my information or maybe that's a site I need to go in and change my information, right? And that, that can keep just one time someone not grabbing a hold of your email contacts or your Facebook list and, or such is, is worth its weight in gold. Okay. Other, other thoughts, questions, commentary? We have one question submitted to the chat. Is this type of scan similar to what our cyber insurance carrier might be doing? Ooh, Jason, you want to get that one? Uh, I, so we, ha we have done, so we help with the assessment side of that with the, uh, with the cybersecurity insurance. The companies that I have worked with our clients on have, have the insurance provider doesn't really do anything. At least those haven't done anything. I hate to say that yours isn't. Um, but the ones that we've worked with, the, the insurance company has, isn't actually doing anything. They are there um, to, if you need to file a claim because you've been compromised. Now, what we have been noticing over the last several years is the policies are being written in a way where your business needs to check some boxes and have certain cybersecurity uh, elements in place, or they will just find a way to deny coverage. So one of the first things that I've been telling our customers to do uh, is to get with your insurance provider and find out what they're looking for um, as, a, as a base minimum that you need to be doing as, as, a, as a client. So that way, if something were to happen and you go to file a claim, they go, well, you weren't doing that. One of the big ones that we see a lot is two-factor authentication on email addresses. So if you're an Office 365 or a G Suite user, um, a lot of them are being written where you've got to have two-factor on that, or they raise your premium, um, or they just deny coverage. Because in a lot of cases, there's a questionnaire sent out, and that questionnaire has gotten a lot bigger and a lot more in-depth over the last two or three years because the amount of claims that are being submitted are through the roof. Uh, small municipalities, small government um, are always in the news about getting breached, um, ransomed, and then having to pay out sometimes seven-figure ransom dollars to get um, to, to get access to their files because their backup may have gotten encrypted as well, or the backup actually didn't work when they came to use it. Um, so we, you definitely want to make sure that you understand what you're supposed to be doing on your end. Like I said, none of the ones that we've worked with so far are proactively looking at dark web for their clients, but that doesn't mean that yours isn't, and that's not a service that they're offering. That's an excellent question. And one of the things I failed to say that we often say is there's really three prongs. So when we come in and we look at protecting your business, you have three tools at your disposal. You have the technology, right? The tools, the software, the hardware. Uh, second to that is you, you have the processes. You have bringing in a managed service provider, somebody who's doing proactive maintenance, keeping your computers and servers and things running, running optimally. Uh, but then the third piece and the one that's often overlooked is your policies and your procedures. Um, we find that when we come in for a consultation, it's very rare when we ask a business owner or practice manager or, or, or some such, you know, what, what's your disaster recovery plan? What's your, what's your internet policy? Um, can you show me what, what in your employee manual, what sort of awareness training are you getting? And what we find is um, the answer is almost none, almost always none. It, you know, when you come on as a new employee during your onboarding process, you get training on how to be a part of the company. You get training on culture. You get training on safety and security. You know, maybe you work in a factory environment and they talk to you about hard hats and, and work boots. But ironically, people don't talk about talking context of cyber hygiene. 
And it's our view, it's our, it's our perspective that in the same way that when a new employee comes into your business or an existing employee that's been there for a while, um, this stuff, you need to be just as aware and have a process and a plan in place just as you would for some kind of natural disaster, just as you would for, uh, you know, you have a fire escape route plan on your hallway, take the stairs, go out this exit, that kind of thing. You know, it's our view that, that this is an integral part of the business at this point. And you have salespeople that sell things for your business. You have marketing people that market for it. You have the technical people that deliver the services. This day and age, if you don't have an IT professional, if you don't have somebody looking over the data, if you don't have someone helping you with a question like this, how, how do I choose the right insurance? What's required for me to fulfill the parameters of, of that insurance if I have a disaster and should I need to make a claim? And this type of stuff is precisely where, where we plug in and this training plugs in. We're trying to create and lift awareness about that and help you with the technology, the processes, uh, and the paperwork in place. Interesting. Are there any more questions? Kind of getting to the end. I wanted to be respectful yes. of everybody's time here. We've got two or three more minutes, and certainly we're at your disposal if there are thoughts that you had and you want to reach out to us. Uh, sidebar, but um, we're at your disposal, Don. If you have thoughts. Yeah, well, I like you said, you you've been very mindful of our time, and it was very interesting um, information. And, and so many people take for granted this work that you all do, and any any company that helps protect our, our cyber information. And it's, we've got to remember, in fact, my husband and I, our bank account was just compromised about a week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily I catch caught it and it was just somebody hacked in. It wasn't even a password issue or anything like that, but it's, you have to pay attention. You have to be aware. And if you have a question, don't, don't just dismiss it, like you said. So thank you so much for that information. Um, and with no more questions, um, again, I'd just like to thank you both for being here and on today's session and your time. Um, really appreciate the information. This is a recording and it will be available for viewing on our Business as its best library page, um, accessible through the partnership login portal on the bgchamber.com. Um, and we will have our next business at its best on June 18th, June 18th with Cecil Garman on active leadership in times of crisis. So hope we can see folks there and tune in then. Um, again, thank you and we appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. I'll take care. Thank you.